Welcome to the Health Tech Horizons podcast, a lab health dedicated space where innovation meets excellence in healthcare. If you're captivated by the dynamic evolution of healthcare, intrigued by the transformative power of technology, and thrilled about pioneering new frontiers in health, this is the place for you. Join us as we spotlight trailblazers, individuals and organizations who are not merely chasing horizons, but shaping them. Get ready for engaging conversations, valuable insights, and a sprinkle of inspiration. I'm Anna Maria Pelucci, your host and fellow advocate on this journey of reimagining and redefining healthcare together. Today's special guest is Dr. Abbas Savar, a tech-savvy physician with over two decades of experience in medicine, digital health, and program management. Dr. Abbas Savar, Digital Health Research Lead at Ontario MD, is leading research initiatives and strategizing AI-integrated digital health solutions to reduce physician burnout. In concert, he's spearheading the development of technical metrics and comprehensive BI tools, such as the award-winning Insights for Care dashboard program, which was designed to evaluate the efficiency of digital solutions in the broader context of healthcare. Dr. Zavar is also a passionate advocate of precision medicine, as he perceives this to be the pinnacle of healthcare. As a subject matter expert on this topic, he has led the transformative Precision Medicine Ecosystem Initiative that aims to elevate patient care and foster better outcomes by delivering the right clinical intervention to the right individuals at the right time. With a robust academic background, including a medical doctorate, a Master of Public Health, and a Master of Health Informatics, Dr. Zavar serves as faculty in the MHI program at the University of Toronto, nurturing the next generation digital health professionals through his expertise. Today, we will delve into the latest trends in digital health, including AI-powered solutions and the transformative potential of precision medicine. We will also explore the vital role of mentorship in shaping the future of healthcare. Thank you very much for joining. I'm so excited to have you here in person. We were introduced on LinkedIn. Yeah. We also had the pleasure of meeting at eHealth. Yeah. That was a great yeah. conference. Yeah, it was great. Amazing. I love it. Yeah. And for me, it was, it was one of the biggest ones that I attended in Canada. It was really nice to see so much drive towards innovation and digital health. And what connected us from the beginning is our passion for digital health. Right. And so our audience was introduced to the amazing things that you're doing, but we want to get to know you a little better. Okay. Now, tell us a little bit about you. First of all, thanks for having me in your podcast program. So there is a long story. It's two book volume, one from my back home, Iran, and the other one about Canada. Um, in Iran, I got my medical degree. Uh, and then working as a family doctor, emergency doctor for a while. And then I got my Master of Public Health. So more focusing on mental health and addiction. I involved with that environment in different uh, capacities as a physician, as a consultant, as a researcher, as a teacher. I got faculty in that area. And meanwhile, I had some director position in health organization similar to the previous lean in Ontario. So I was the head of that net health network. And some time I was a hospital CEO. So I have a habit with lots of hats. So, okay. so in that environment, I founded the first private institute for preventive medicine. Wow. I have been involved with the public healthcare system in my back from Iran. And I found lots of gaps, for example, prevention or digital health. So I gather an amazing talent team and start working on prevention in different level, mental health, addiction, youth, uh, even elderly. And also we have started lots of initiatives uh, on digital health, which familiar with digital health and precision medicine. And that was almost around 2012 before I came to Canada. All right. And 2015, I came to Canada because I had that vision for precision medicine because we need to build it or design it. So I started from a certificate at um, Ryerson, previous Ryerson, TMU right now, and then moved to the master program at UFT and also involved with several companies as a digital health consultant, 
and then I dive in the data analytics domain of under digital health umbrella and work as a data scientist some projects it was great I really love that and right now I'm working in Ontario MD working with lots of initiatives how we can support uh, primary care or community-based physician and also I came back to the same master program I'm teaching there uh, as I said, I, I love hats, so That's still great. I'm involved with lots of opportunities. So for those that are interested, quantitative skills in health, health analytics. My course, health yeah, informatics. My okay. quantitative skills in healthcare. Yes, very interesting. I love that course. Uh, it's a combination <laughs> of health data and analytics. Right? Exactly. Right. You decided as a physician, you have the depth of knowledge of medical needs, and then also at being a CEO of a hospital gave you perspective of the challenges of the healthcare institution. Yep. And then now you're getting the analytics, the data scientist perspective. Tell me a little bit of how did you go from medicine to data science? Because data science, I can see statistics be maybe a lot of it would be connected in both fields. You have to understand statistics in order yeah. to read studies and research. You need to be a doctor. You need to know how those studies were made. Uh, but tell me a little bit more about how that jump happened and what were the challenges and how, what did you think helped? I was familiar with this concept because I worked in, also I founded the first addiction research center in my back home. So I was involved with research environment, data analytics, statistics, those stuff. And as I said, my vision was about precision medicine. And this is a very big concept, including lots of sub concept inside of that. And if you go down in the core would be all our related data. For precision medicine and AI definitely because there's big data we need AI to handle those data connect our data and anal analyze it and extract clinical insight in messy health data yes so for that reason I think that if I want to design that blueprint yes. a big holistic precision medicine approach I have to familiar with the level of data science mm -hmm. and data analytics so for this reason I invested that area. Got it. Did you miss medicine per se once you geared away from intense medical practice to more data science? Did you find that you missed medicine or did you find a new passion? Somehow, but new life is more, it's more of a passion. Mm -hmm. But it's still, I, I'm not uh, as a doctor practicing here. I'm supporting my wife. She's family doctor, so I support her nice. in her clinic as an assistant somehow. Again, I'm Designing Maybe. something for family doctors. On Which perspective. is so great because you bounce ideas off of each other. And that keeps you also very much deeply involved in yes. and the world and the functioning of exactly. medicine. Yeah. What is most excited for you right now, either within your organization or outside of it in digital health? The right hot topic right now, AI in healthcare. Yes. After explosion by chat gpt two years ago i started very comprehensive studies environmental scan to understand if without any barrier i want to implement a precision medicine approach in ontario how much ontario is ready for that mm -hmm. so we start investigating interview almost 100 director or different level of the healthcare system and try to understand what's happening for data in ontario because as for precision medicine, we don't only need health data. We need genomics data. We need lifestyle. We need environmental data. So we start digging mm -hmm. and finding, okay, what's happening? And finally, we published the result as a white paper last year and shows us that all of our data are not only is messy, not accurate, different standards, mm -hmm. they are silent. Nobody have access to it and nobody want to share it. So data exchange, interoperability, data accuracy, they are the big challenge right now. And I, my focus is that how can I connect it, these dots with AI is the perfect idea. Otherwise, how, what would be the solution? We can resolve these gaps and barriers. So. When you say people don't want to share data, is it because they find it to be a competitive advantage for their business? Or is it because of fear of liability or mistakes that they made, unfortunately? Or privacy, security, liability, all of, the all of this. 
do you find that recently there's a more concerted effort uh, at the government level to bring companies together at the e-health conference? We saw a lot of the interoperability concept. It was probably the main thing discussed there. And discussion is one thing, and I'm really excited about that. But being so close to the issue, do you find that currently the rate of change, implementation, and preparation has increased or it's the same? Hopefully, <laughs> they are changing something for sure. I believe from last year, Ontario Minister of Health in Ontario and also at the national level, they are more focused on data level about anything about data, standards, interoperability, and they want to provide new policies and approaches. But the thing that I'm seeing is too slow. Too slow. We are very behind what's happening in the environment, in the mm-hmm. market, in mm-hmm. the business. Our system is very behind. For example, as right now, we are talking about AI in healthcare, mm-hmm. but AR is all other industries yes. for years. Yes, that's true. And even we want to implement AI in our system. Okay, we don't have the foundation for that. AI needs huge data, big data to mature their algorithm. But when we siloed our data, we said, okay, because of privacy, because of security, I don't want to share my data. So there is no fit for our AI system. And in one way, I'm thinking if we have, if we take our time implementing the regulations and the ethics considerations while the rest of the world creates the technologies, we can then implement it safer in healthcare once we know what we're doing. And that's one way to look at it. Yep. The other way to look at it is how much would we achieve if we started at this time? And I see a lot happening, especially UFT, veterans. Commissioner, there's a lot happening and a lot of different companies are working. Like you said, it's there's siloed AI initiatives in healthcare and that hopefully at some point we'll communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. But I think the most promising thing I've seen recently is the eHub that I understood was created as a government initiative platform where different, some of the largest players are plugging in mm-hmm. in order to share data and organize it. And it's not a very commonly known thing that is happening, but it is definitely moving things forward yeah. very quickly. Hopefully. That's something that is both controversial, because I feel mm-hmm. a lot of people might not like the fact that's right. happening. And then some people will get very excited about the fact that things are finally starting to move. Right. How do you feel about that? Yeah, um, this is a very multifactorial environment. As I said, okay, it's about what is the origin of data? in the hospital, in the doctor's offices. And the data is there is in different standards. Mm-hmm. And the accuracy is low, mm-hmm. and messy. So we need to define digital health solutions, preferably AI solutions to handle this data, clean this data, and make them as the same language. Right now we have 15 EMR vendors in community based environment. Wow. And any of our hospitals is talking different language, mm-hmm. Epic, Meditech, Cerner. Yeah. Yes. So there are lots of languages. None of them understand each other. So yeah. we need to define this layer by layer and connect all, all dots. I would say, based on what the news is, they, like it's showing us that Epic is really leading the way. Uh, I see that their collaboration with Nuance and Microsoft, uh, and they're adding different platforms to really lead the way in the way documentation is automated, uh, yep. transcription is ambient. Uh, and so, and then I see a lot of what's happening with Google and their whole entire system. Right. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how different companies are going to address these drastic changes in the landscape. Yeah, for sure. You know, as you mentioned, lots of big companies, even smaller ones, vendors, they are focusing this area, how they can, they want to apply AI in their system, how they connect with my personal concern. The core system for all EMR systems, they are very old. We are using 20 years technology. Wow, yeah. they, they are not really. And patchwork. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is exactly the case with all technologies that are AI based right now, I find, because you have 
as I work with, let's say, technologies with social media, or for project management or analytics, whatever may be the case, there's always something that's created new that has one issue in mind, but doesn't think of everything else. Some of them are address more issues at once, but I feel like it will take a little time before they get worked in, tested, and matched with the technologies that suit them, with the opportunities that are best, and also obviously, as usual, there's a lot of entrance in the market when something new comes, right. and then times the ones that are not appropriate drop, drop them off. So I feel like we're in a tumultuous period of trial and error, <laughs> and it will last for a while. And this is a great opportunity for many, right. uh, but it will also be a period of, of loss for some because, and I find a lot of people rush to solve one problem, but that whole map needs to be worked out yep. before any opportunity makes sense hundred percent. And it's a network. You yes. can't touch only one thing without others. Yes. This is a network. All there are connected, even hidden mm. connection. Yes. How does that look for you? Or what are you doing in this group? And I know you're involved with that kind of work. What are your efforts in that? Yeah, I see it in different perspectives. Because as I said, this is very a big initiative or project. Maybe I definitely a big team required to handle that. Definitely should be from public side and government. I like to design that blueprint, but I realize that, okay, it's, it's out of my, not my one experience person. with that one person. Yes. So let's back to the precision medicine. Yeah. Precision medicine, I hear that it was valued, uh, the market was valued at about 74 billion US dollars in oh, 2022. Yeah. And it's estimated to grow to 174, if I remember correctly, by 2030, which is a roughly almost 12% growth. And oncology and uh, rare disease having the bigger chunk of that growth or leading the growth. And so how do you feel things are progressing in precision medicine and genomics? And what do you find most exciting there? So first of all, I want to maybe correct the misconception about precision medicine. Precision medicine or personalized medicine. When you talk about that, Everybody only think about genomic side of precision medicine. Mm -hmm. We are missing lifestyle and environment. Mm -hmm. All of those investments you mentioned, they are on genomics or a bigger one, omics, is protomics, metabolomics, mm -hmm. microbiomics, all of those biomarkers. All of those investments, it's only in that one of the four main data component for precision medicine. This is omics, health data, lifestyle, and environment. Mm -hmm. And in my, in my white paper, I recommended that the fifth one would be SDOH, social determinant of health, Which because there are some factors we are missing in these four, but that one should be the fifth one. But SDOH is a very complex, it's an umbrella term as well. So when For you're sure. saying that it's not one term, like genetics is a new thing. You, can yeah, get exactly. you look at it yeah, exactly. on the microscope or whatever. Because it's a lab, is it yes, tangible, controlled. we can do it. Okay, I want to invest this. Yes. But if we want to go for precision medicine or personalized plan, yes. we need all of those information. So indeed, I just wanted to map out the, the future. Okay. And then for sure, we need to reverse engineering oh. about that. Okay. Right. What we can do. Because I have done, I believe it's almost one year. It's a continuous study, environmental scan for all AI solution in healthcare. So I have a big list of all AI. Okay. And I try to categorize them, understand, okay, what are their focus? And then I found, okay, as I mentioned, for, for some issue or gap, several companies, they are investing and they are missing others. Yes. So I just wanted to show that map only for primary care for now. Yes. We need, to, we need to extend it for all healthcare cities. But for primary care, I said, okay, we need this. I, I believe I defined 40 AI solutions. Okay. So we need this 40 AI solution to cover all workflow, pre-visit, in-visit, and post-visit. So we have maybe five AI solutions okay. in the market, okay. but 35 opportunities there. 
So now we want to know what does that look like? The patient journey or the physician or physician journey through these ideal setups oh, okay. and how we are. I love to say. If you can give <laughs> us a little snapshot of what you're working on. That. So let's back to the precision medicine. Yes. Precision medicine is the ideal version of healthcare that we are expecting. I agree. The best definition I found for that one, providing right clinical intervention could be diagnosis, treatment, or prevention at the right time for the right individual. This is exactly what we expect. Then we should reverse engineering how we should prepare our system to achieve this amazing approach. But there are lots of layers, and I call it ecosystem because the kind of ecosystem, all elements, they are affect each other and they are connected each other. Then defining all of those elements in this ecosystem, it's very hard. We need a big team with different expert um, leadership, data governance, data analytics. The core is AI for sure, privacy, security, all of them. Last month, I created envisioning the future. If a primary care workflow fully AI integrated, Ignore all barriers, ignore all gaps. Okay. If we have all AI solutions in okay. primary care. Okay. And I de- designed it in three stages, pre-visit, in-visit, post-visit. Okay. For patient and physician. How patient can play and deal with AI, mm-hmm. pre-visit, get ready for the visit, education, scheduling, reminder, everything. In the visit, how AI can handle everything for physician. We don't want to replace any physician by AI, but AI would be the best assistant for handling and managing this big data for physician right now. It's not only EMR data, it's coming data from hospital, anywhere else. If we see it as a precision medicine, data should come from wearables, should come from uh, a smartphone, a smartwatch, IoT. Mm-hmm. It should come from lifestyle, environment, genomics, omics, everything. So this I can see solving two big issues, which is uh, wasted time for everybody. So no waiting times because a lot of the issues have been handled in advance. Patients obviously have access to physicians and specialists more because they are more available. And then obviously physician burnout. Uh, And we have that in nursing too. So I know it very intimately, but that's also very close to your heart. Uh, yep. Yeah. So. yeah. I came with all of these idea, uh, ideas to solve the burnout. Exactly. Yeah. And we, and also all the time we are talking about patient centric approach, Yeah. but we don't have it. Yes. But in this envisioning, yeah. it's pa- patient centric. Yes. All information about patient, we want to gather it, clean it and prepare it for a personalized plan. Mm-hmm. And physician, they don't need to having a very cognitive burden mm-hmm. to handle these data, following all research, new publication, papers, articles, new guidelines, everything, all already are categorized in the system, ready yeah. with some recommendation for you. And even in the visit, they don't need all the time to see the monitor and type it. The system understands it. This is a very compassionate care plan. Uh, in Ontario, the, uh, the group that I'm working with, that one is a partnership and stakeholders. So we want to bring in all digital health experts and companies work together. And this Ontario, this new strategy for Ontario is that how we can lead them. So I believe this map help Ontario to lead startups, company, new companies, or even vendors. Okay, this is the ideal version of primary care workflow. How, let's see and sit and wow. think together how we can solve it. Got it. How we can achieve it. Mm-hmm. Because the most partners that are currently working with on trend is community based EMR vendors. So they have very old technology. Definitely, they need to have an enhancement or improvement in their system if they want to handle this new map. Tell me a little bit more about your role at CFD and how you came to 
teach there? And what's your favorite part about that? The, the course that I'm teaching, I started two years ago, and this fall would be the third year. So it was a total revamp of our old course that I have done it in my master program. It was very advanced statistic course with lots of crazy formula of statistics using SPSS is that the old fashioned mm -hmm. software and it's not practical for MHI or master of health informatics graduates. I have never used that skills in my job or any of other graduates. Several times a student's graduate gave feedback to the program director. And finally, Dr. Karim Kishafti, our recent program director, said, okay, I know that you are working data science, so give me an offer, what you can do, how you can rebound it. So I put together with one of my friends and co-instructors, we started with the statistics in combination of SAS. So SAS is the most popular coding software in the government institute right now in Canada. So it's not very advanced. It's a high level of statistics. That's very routine skills they may need for any research in the project or research in the, any publication or something. And they start learning with SAS. And then we, they need to prepare data for their analysis. We also touching some SQL, very advanced SQL coding. And uh, as you said, this is package for our statistic. We did, uh, divided two packages, statistic, SAS, SQL, and then data science with understanding what is the basic of natural language processing, NLP. Yeah. We, we this is the develop some synthetic EMR mm -hmm. data. So, so, so the students should have very Modern. messy data. Okay. So they have to clean it, wrangling data and prepare some inside because we don't want to very jump deep in the coding. It's not very. We just want to learn some very basic, basic. of coding. Yeah. For this reason, I'm teaching Rapid Miner. It's a very advanced analytics software without any coding. It's just all visual. Oh my gosh. You like just, for example, nine? Sorry? Nine, the analytics. Uh, yeah, I heard. So that's notes. Yeah. It's a very, no coding again, and it's a very practical way of visualizing yeah, analytics. Yeah, Rapid Miner is that That's what I learned when I did. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah? yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, but yeah. Rapid Miner is very advanced. Even you can design AI or deep learning wow. that one. Okay, so what's the level of knowledge that you have to have in order to be successful? Maybe not excel in the courses that you're teaching, but just be successful and finish and pass and for those interested. We just prepare them. We just let them understand what's happening in these shelters because they are very fresh students for this master program. Okay. And all the time I am doing pre-course assessment. Okay, mm -hmm. what is the level of your knowledge about the statistics or yes data science. I know that because I group them fairly in the group assignment. Oh, okay. I don't want to put all people in, in the high level of coding in the group. Okay. So I spread out in different groups. So, so you have to have some level of coding knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Some, some of level of statistics. Zero. Some have zero. Yes. And they can still be successful. Yeah, because book? those assignments or all course materials support them a step by step move forward to learning more about that. Okay. And if you are prepared them for the next level, it would be the other course, it would be about the AI. Mm -hmm. So they have to play with very basic of AI. Okay. This another course. So we are pre prepared them for that the other. And how long is that course? Two years. years. And it's for two different cohorts. One from regular one. There are more people from bachelor they are coming. Yeah. In the regular one. And we have a practicum for them. They will go in the second year in some companies working and implement a project, design and implement. Also, we have the other core is an executive core for yeah. some people that already they are working in the system. Mm -hmm. They just want to hone, hone, or, yeah, school, and hone their skills in this environment. So they join us and instead of practicum, they have to design and implement the project in their workplace. Oh, got it. So, Oh, and so I'm assuming that the answer is many, but what would be the roles that someone completing this master's program would assume or would be able to look forward to? Yeah, this is in that. In terms of actual titles. Yeah. I'm supporting the program director, Dr. Shabli, in this way. We are doing some market research and do some evaluation. Okay, what's happening for all 
similar program in Canada because we have the same master program in Dalhousie, McMaster, Waterloo, Victoria. And we saw that any of us, we are seeing this big package in different way. McMaster from business. Victoria more focused on health information. Victoria is, Waterloo is very technical. We are- All the engineers are there. <laughs> exactly. We are seeing this one from leadership and policy made because our program is under IHPME, yeah. Institute of Health Policy and Management. Mm -hmm. So we are focusing that environment and we are planning to improving the, the whole curriculum to train future leaders for digital health for that Canada. I might check it out yeah. myself. Good news that yes. for the first time we want to conduct a new conference in mm -hmm. digital health. Okay. Call it Flick. It's mm -hmm. about leadership, digital health leadership and policy making mm -hmm. in next February. I think I saw that actually. Yeah. It's and a we part all of the had the, exactly. sorry, digital health. I exactly. saw that. And I put a note in my calendar to check it out to see. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. So what are you envisioning it as? Sure. As I said, because now we are focusing on for our program, leadership and policy making. Yes. So the concept of that pro conference is the same. We don't want focusing on technical, new technology okay. or something. We are focusing on what are the gaps in policy making in digital health environment yes. and how we can lead it. We are just accepting submission as a briefing note, not as a very academic paper. Okay. So then it would be a lecture in the panel, poster presentation, and also we created up with other universities. Mm -hmm. So the core would be in the Hart House in February 22nd next year with in-person people, panels, government, or a specific guests we will have there. Mm -hmm. And in the same time, we have five other hubs live Mm -hmm. In IHPME, in McMaster, Dalhousie, Waterloo, and Victoria, mm -hmm. they are participating in the live uh, virtual hotline. And so I know that passing the baton is very important to you and mentoring aligns with the fact that you're teaching as well. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, to be honest, to find this pathway for myself in Canada, I had a couple of great mentors, okay. so I I have learned from them that in, we are all immigrants in Canada, so we need mentors when we come. I should reveal one yes. of them. So, <laughs> Karim Kishavti, as I mentioned, is a program director, is an amazing, unique person in the world, and it's an amazing mentor for me. Great. So we have done lots of projects and initiatives together. And when I asked, okay, how can I give you back your amazing job you have done for me. I said, just continue Karim's job, move yeah. forward. Yeah. So I'm following that yeah. and I'm happy because I know the situation of specifically physicians, maybe they are coming in Canada with some new ideas, with a very amazing background expertise. And maybe it's the right location, but not right time for them. I just want to help them. Okay quickly settle, find different alternatives, how they get prepared for this new culture yeah. and move forward to any of this pathway. Yes. I, I like it and I follow that That's mentorship. Yeah. Is it a formalized venue for you to bring people together this way or is it more informal with one-on-one -on -one people approach you? How does it look right now, this mentorship that you're doing? Is it different a little bit? <laughs> I'm working, I'm supporting several organizations. For example, I designed the first bridging program for skills for change. It mm -hmm. was a specific bridging program for health informatics for IMGs, international medical graduates. But also they're still supporting them or access employment or what the other companies achieve. So any of them, they have a course of workshops about this one. So I support them, teaching them and some people that they are more interested in digital health, they are supporting mentoring and I meant for the the package of mentorship. So I do mentoring with them. Also, some people quickly reach out to me on LinkedIn. 
I'm always happy yes. to open to everybody on LinkedIn to support them. And also I designed, I call it personalized training, precision to train. Really? It's in person mentorship program I have done with a couple of people. It's still a lot of people reaching out, but unfortunately I don't have enough time to do that one. <laughs> no. I want to thank you for your time. My this pleasure. has been a tremendous experience. Thank you. For to being connected uh, for and sure. also to hopefully doing it soon in the future. Okay. Thank My you pleasure. for your time. Thank you.